Welcome. Uh, welcome to the final two sessions of paper presentations uh, for this workshop. Uh, my name is Daniel Perotiu Pietro. I'm a senior research scientist at Bloomberg in New York and will be the host for this session. Uh, so in this final hour, we'll have we'll hear about from two uh, from four paper presentations from two very important types of papers to this workshop, developments of new resources and system demonstrations. As in previous sessions, please ask questions on the chat or by a meeting at the end of the talk. So we'll start with the two resource papers. The first is named a data set of uh, for statutory reasoning in tax law entailment and question answering. And it's authored by Neil Holzenberger, Andrew Blair Stanek, and Benjamin Van Derm from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, we'll have this, the video recording played and Niels is available in the chat uh, or at the end of the talk for questions. Hello, and thank you for tuning in. Our paper focuses on a specific aspect of legal reasoning. We're interested in applying statutes to the facts of a case. We refer to this as statutory reasoning, and we're doing this in the context of US tax law. Here's the prototypical problem that we're interested in. We have a short snippet of natural language text, which describes a number of facts. For example, Alice made this much money in 2017. Alice is married. Alice has this many children. The question is, how much tax does Alice owe in 2017? The way to answer this question is to take into account all of tax law and to apply it to Alice's situation. Concretely, tax law is a large corpus of rules made up of the statutes passed by Congress and the materials produced by the Internal Revenue Service. The way we would currently solve this natural language problem is by collecting a large number of cases, annotating them, and training a statistical model on them. When we get a new case, we hope that our model is able to generalize to it. In practice, this will work to some extent. However, Congress keeps passing new legislation every year and the Internal Revenue Service keeps producing new material. As a consequence, a case that was judged one way in the past might be judged differently in the future. So there is no way you can entirely ignore the statutes. This problem is relevant to natural legal language processing and it also has features that are interesting beyond the legal domain. Statutory reasoning involves reasoning with legal rules. Legal rules are valid by virtue of being agreed to and are generally stated only once. In contrast to domains such as physics, these rules cannot be picked up by statistical evidence alone. This motivates developing models that are able to utilize prescriptive rules stated in natural language and that are able to generalize to rules they have not seen in training. As a starting point for this problem, we took nine sections from tax law and removed any references to other sections. We also removed repetitive subsections. The result is a closed set of rules that refer to each other. Each section is made up of a number of subsections. We frame each subsection as a predicate that is either true or false given the facts of a case. For each subsection, we wrote two test cases, one where the subsection applies, one where it does not. In addition, we wrote 100 cases where the question is, how much tax does the main protagonist owe? The cases, as well as the interpretation of the statutes, were vetted by my co-author and law professor, Andrew Blair Stanek. The resulting corpus of rules and cases has a number of interesting features, which we detail and quantify in the paper. Solving our problem requires natural language understanding and logical reasoning with rules. To prove that this problem is solvable, we wrote a solver based on Prolog. Prolog is a logical reasoning language which can interpret if-then rules and prove assertions. Our Prolog solver is made up of two parts. First, we translated the statutes to a set of rules that Prolog can interpret. Each subsection was framed as a Prolog rule. Second, each case was translated to a small knowledge graph that strictly reflects the facts contained in the case. The Prolog program can reason about the knowledge graph and draw conclusions. Here is an example of how we translated a subsection to a Prolog rule. This is subsection 1b, which specifies how heads of households are to be taxed. The first line checks whether the taxpayer qualifies as a head of household for the given taxable year. The next line computes the taxpayer's taxable income for the taxable year. Taxable income is defined in section 63. That is why you see S63 here. The following disjunction translates the tax schedule. 
How did we translate cases to a knowledge graph? We had to rely on an ontology of atomic events. We picked events at the same granularity level as the statutes. Anything the statutes do not further specify, we assumed was an atomic event. The result is a set of around 60 events. As an example, here is how we translate that Bob and Alice got married on August 24th, 1970. We say there is a marriage event, Alice is involved, Bob is involved, and the event starts on August 24th, 1970. One common sense knowledge assumption that our model makes is that since this event has no end, it is still ongoing. So I guess they must be celebrating their golden wedding anniversary. Now we have a prologue program that can solve this problem. It's very costly to produce manually. The knowledge graphs were also produced manually. How to automatically generate the prologue program and the knowledge graphs is an open research question. An orthogonal approach is to replace logical operators and explicit structure with dense high dimensional vector representations and real value functions, both being learned through distributional statistics. It's natural to ask whether we could learn to solve this problem automatically using machine learning. For that purpose, we've recast our data set so that we could apply state-of-the-art machine reading models. The cases that test the understanding of specific subsections, we recast as recognizing textual entailment. The question is binary. Does the subsection apply to the context? We train using cross-entropy and report accuracy. Our numerical questions we recast as a regression task. Usually, in regression tasks, one reports mean squared error. We tried to train with mean squared error, but realized it was not very informative because the scale of tags can vary greatly from one problem to the other. Instead, we looked at how tax law itself treats deviations from the true amount of tax owed. Tax law defines substantial understatement of tax as understating tax owed by more than 10% of the true amount of tax owed. We adapt this to substantial over or understatement of tax. If our model predicts a number that is within 10% of the true amount of tax owed, we count its prediction as correct. As is done in tax law, this criterion is slightly different for tax amounts below $50,000. The goal for a company would be to incur no penalties while paying the least amount of tax as possible. We train our model on this problem using hinge laws. Here are the results of our models. First, a word about our baselines. In blue, is the accuracy of our baseline for the entailment task. It's a majority baseline, and it gets 50% of cases right. The vertical bar represents the 90% confidence intervals. In yellow is our baseline for the numerical task. It's the one number that minimizes the hinge loss on the training set. It gets 20% of cases right. We tried two natural language understanding models, one based on BERT, the other one based on word vectors. Both models perform close to the baseline within the 90% confidence intervals. To check whether our dataset is biased, we trained models that only had access to the question, so no facts of the case and no statutes. If our dataset had been biased, they would perform significantly better than the baseline. That's not the case, so our datasets aren't biased. How do we explain that our natural language understanding models do not perform better than the baseline? They're models that were trained for general domain English language. Legal language is quite different from Wikipedia or newspaper language, so it could be that they're not adapted to the legal domain. To test this hypothesis, we adapted both models to the legal domain. For BERT, we started with case.law, which is a corpus of cases released by the Harvard Library. We filtered it and picked a random subset and fine-tuned BERT using the language model objective to obtain legal BERT. For word vectors, we filtered case.law to only keep cases related to tax law. We added IRS private letter rulings and US tax court cases to obtain a corpus about tax law. We ran the word to vec package to obtain 500 dimensional word vectors, which we called tax vectors. We then checked that legal BERT was more adapted to the legal domain than BERT. First, we measured perplexity on our data set of cases. Neither BERT nor legal BERT have ever seen them at training time. Legal BERT's perplexity was much lower, showing that it's better suited to our dataset. Second, we fine-tuned BERT and legal BERT on a BIO tagging task around legal terms of art. Two things to note. First, 
legal BERT performs better than BERT. Second, both models outperform trained lawyers. This is because legal terms of art were taken from Black's Law Dictionary. The dictionary has certain standards in deciding what is and what isn't a legal term of art. The lawyers may not be familiar with those standards, while BERT and legal BERT had a chance to learn those standards during training. Both of these experiments prove that legal BERT is fine-tuned to the legal domain. How do these new models do on our task? They still perform at the same level as the baseline. In addition, models that have access to the statutes do not perform better than those that don't. This seems to indicate that they're not using the statutes and so are not actually reasoning. We have shown with our prologue solver that natural language understanding and logical reasoning are sufficient to solve the task of statutory reasoning. We know that current machine reading has excellent natural language understanding based on its performance on other natural language processing tasks. Yet, these models struggle on statutory reasoning despite adaptation to the legal domain. Our ablation experiments show that they are not using the statutes to solve the problem. To us, our results suggest three possible research directions towards solving statutory reasoning, here in no particular order. First, should we invest in semantic parsing for the legal domain? This would mean building models that can automatically generate the prologue program from the statutes, as well as automatically generate the knowledge graph from the natural language description of a case. Second, how can we automatically or semi-automatically generate training data for this problem based on pre-existing legal cases? Third, what are ways to make machine reading more data efficient? I will close by summarizing the contributions of this paper. We've built a closed set of statutes for tax law, which we frame as a hierarchical set of predicates. We're providing cases that test the understanding of individual subsections, as well as cases that test the understanding of the entirety of the statutes. We show that a manually constructed prologue program, as well as manually constructed knowledge graphs, can solve all of our cases. In addition, we've built corpora to train legal domain language models, and we provide trained language models. We hope that our data sets and models are a useful contribution to natural legal language processing. We also hope that our task and data set provide a challenge for machine reading that motivates developing models that can reason with rules specified in natural language. I am leaving you with the reference to our paper, as well as our website, where you will find links to the data sets, the prologue solver, and the language models. Thank you for listening. Any questions, if people want to unmute uh, and ask? I would have one question in particular regarding the OCR um, component. Do you think that, uh, what do you feel is the quality for, uh, so you use the OCR uh, text as input for, uh, for training your models. What do you think uh, is the error rate there? And do you think that was like, a, was a major factor in uh, why those models were not representing, uh, are not representing text correctly? Uh, I so this is Niels. I could answer, but I'm seeing that Andrew is here. Andrew, do you want to jump in? Yes. Um, are you are you talking about the uh, case dot law uh, being the yeah? Base? yeah. Um, that may well have. So I hadn't thought about that. It is case dot law is definitely an amazing resource. It does have some serious OCR issues. I wouldn't expect it to cause huge problems specifically for tax. Uh, was there a particular, I, I, I might not understand why, uh, so, so it probably did, did increase the error rate, but uh, was there a particular uh, transmission route? No, I, I was just, um, I was just uh, wondering if you have like a handle on how good the OCR is, uh, is based on that content as we were like working on something related uh, recently. Uh, it's pretty good. Uh, hopefully, uh, Bert, on average, will uh, will we we hope that on average Bert will figure that figure out the uh, uh, the correct uh, way to interpret or read the the language. It, it uh, uh, one of the main concerns we had is 
that, uh, or one of the main reasons we used uh, the case.log corpus, which is fantastic for uh, fine tuning vert is just that the, uh, amongst other things, the citations are just uh, very unusual, uh, an unusual part of the texture of any sort of legal uh, uh, document, at least in the United States. And uh, we uh, found, of course, sometimes the citations are, uh, are incorrect, but on average, it definitely seems, as the perplexity showed, it tends to be much, uh, much lower and uh, handles the, the fine-tuned version handles uh, every sort of legal text we threw at it better than, uh, better than just the standard uh, BERT. Not sure I answered your question. I'm sorry if I... No, and I had one, one follow-up. So you mentioned that about training this BERT. Is this available? Because even if it, it wasn't as useful in this test, pro potentially it would be useful for, for others. Yes, yes, it is all. Uh, both, uh, you're, you're talking about the uh, BERT trained on case.law? Yeah, yeah. Yes, it is one of the resources. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post the website on the, on the chat. On the chat, yeah, perfectly. That would be great. Yeah. Okay, so without, uh, so we'll be moving on to the next paper. So our next presenter uh, is Emilia Taylor for, from the Polytechnic of the University of Malawi and NIASA. Uh, limited. She will present her paper MWCC, a corpus of Malawi criminal cases. Hello everyone. I'm just going to start the video and the presentation. Uh, <clears throat> if you give me just uh, one, one minute. Oh, okay. Yes. <clears throat> uh, can you see the presentation? Okay, we can. All right. Um, we will give a short background to this work, sorry. talk about um, the processes involved in creating the corpus, annotations with... I'm sorry, I think I have the uh, narration being set up. Just one second. <clears throat> I'm not sure how I should do it without the narration. Let me just try. Uh, okay, I, I, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to repeat what I said in the video. But I'm going to uh, go through it in a slightly different order. But basically, I wanted to tell you first the um, uh, motivation behind this work. And to do that, I'm just going to give you a little context um, in Malawi. So, the first thing to say is that in Malawi there is... Um, very um, little <clears throat> text, written text, in terms of uh, legal, legal text, like commentaries, um, digests, and most of the judgments have only been made available recently, uh, particularly since 2013. Uh, there are about 22 high court judges um, they work on a three-tier system. I'm not going to go into details, but basically there are a, a small number of judges. Magistrates are the ones who um, deal with cases that are of a you know, lower importance, and they tend, it tends to be um, the body of magistrates is made up of legally trained uh, professionals, but also those that have made their way through the system from the clerks um, in, in the high court and they have, um, so they are basically lay magistrates. Okay, so only one in about eight have a law degree. Uh, and then it's the law society and I'm not going to read that. Uh, the other thing that uh, it's important to note is there's a huge backlog of cases. Um, since, you know, 2016, a lot of the people in prisons are on remand. So basically, these are people awaiting trials. So the turnover in terms of uh, cases being judged uh, is very low. Okay. In terms of legal advice, uh, this is quite poor, especially in rural areas. Um, and as I said before, there's a poor, poor law reporting. Okay. I'm going to jump now to the presentation that I gave you. Um, here. So what we wanted to do 
is we wanted to um, create an organized way in which the high court judgments to start with can be classified and they can be useful for the legal practitioners. Uh, mainly to increase access to legal representation, basically, and also to the text of the case law in Malawi, to the professionals and also to the uh, people, you know, who, who, who need to be represented. So our judgments um, tend to cover substantial, more substantial cases, and this uh, become part of the legal reports. Um, they are disseminated and catalogued by the registrar and the library. So typically, the library maintains physical folders um, organized by the year of issue. And it uses an emailing service by which they send scans of the judgments to various subscribers. These tend to be legal firms. Um, so where we are now, so basically the availability of legal text in Malawi is poor, although there have been uh, some um, breakthroughs in terms of uh, making this text available online. Um, like Malawi Lee, Malawi Lee is an initiative that is worldwide and is, make, is making text available free of charge. But this text is not really organized in a way that can be um, used for uh, legal research. So what we wanted to do is to improve the text by adding some metadata uh, and to add keynotes and summaries. And the other thing we wanted to do is to improve the linkage and the navigation between the cases and also between the cases and law citations. Okay, um, I'm going to skip uh, this slide, but you can see it at your leisure. So our data, as I said, is made up of um, criminal judgments that cover the period 2010 to 2019. And most of these cases are not available online. Some are on Malawi Lee, but they are obtainable uh, from the judiciary. Okay, so we deal with electronic files that are scanned images of judgments. Uh, this diagram shows, gives you an idea of the stages involved in creating our corpus. So we started with the scanned images of judgments. We went through a process of cataloging these files. There was quite a, a, um, a great deal of renaming, checking, spelling. There were duplicates file or files merged in the same document that had to be split and so on. Uh, the other thing we did is image adjustments. Now all these um, were uh, automatic steps or they were designed to be automatic steps that can help us scale our corpus in the future. Okay, and then cataloging the images and establishing a name convention. We used uh, a batch OCR process by which we scanned the images and obtained uh, JSON uh, equivalent text and this was like a word-by-word -word representation of the image and we also kept some of the formatting uh, onto the documents, which were helpful in adding some of the metadata we were interested in. And then we uh, reconstructed the text of the judgments from the JSON files uh, to create the corpus of our files. Through, in this process, we also arranged the text so that it is structured. So we added some of the metadata we uh, talked in our research and aim slide, or basically uh, case-related metadata, like the name of the judge, the case number, the court in which the case was heard, the quorum, uh, which were the lawyers and clerks and various people, appellants and the respondents involved in the case and also some information in terms of the appellate chain, uh, the cases in the same appellate chain as the one we looked at. So we created our corpus files, and finally we added annotations. And these annotations were annotations with uh, references to laws and references to other cases. And finally, we have obtained our corpus. And um, this image uh, gives you a little idea of the OCR involved. One thing to note on the left hand side you can see the structure of the judgment uh, very clearly demarcated. Not all the judgments were in the same format but you can see on the top side uh, information pertaining to the case. So this would be like external metadata that helps us identify the case 
we are looking at, and then the uh, text of the judgments after the word order. Um, on the right hand side you see a typical text of a judgment structured in paragraphs and you can see some of the formatting which would be useful in uh, adding annotations to our judgment. So for example, uh, the names of the cases that are cited appear in italics. This is by no means um, the same in other cases, in other judgments that we saw. So some judges do not use any formatting, but some use uh, italic, some use bold, and so on. The other thing to note is there's a frequent reference and, you know, quotes from other cases, and these appear, you know, in different types of styles of quotations. And the other thing to also note is the presence of headers and the footers in the judgments. And these have to be integrated to the uh, main uh, text later on because they are important. As you can see here, a lot of the footnotes are actually uh, case citations or parts of case citations. So the name of the case appears in text and uh, the actual reference appears in the footnote. Okay. So there were a few challenges in the OCR. I'm not going to go through all of them. Just thing to note here that uh, we wished uh, we had um, uh, made, you know, made use of more of the formatting available in the text. So if we had a process initially uh, when we started in which we established some of the features that were present in the, in the text, that would made it easier for us. So some kind of image processing in which we extract some of these uh, useful features. Um, okay, and uh, our corpus consists of, at the moment, 682 judgments that we processed. Um, in the corpus, each judgment has associated two text files, one with the introduction, just as you saw in that image, and one with the text of the body of the judgment. And then we have an XML format um, following the text encoding initiative in which we added uh, case metadata and labeled paragraphs. And then we have the annotation files uh, that I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, this is a kind of structure that we have in our files. As you can see, the information pertaining to the parties involved. So the name of the case at the top there, um, the numbering, the court of hearing, um, you can see uh, a case in the same appellate chain at the top, in the case information, the parties involved, and so on. And then the text of the judgment appearing in structured paragraphs. Okay. Uh, we have analyzed our corpus in terms of uh, the usual uh, linguistic features. Uh, it's not a large corpus at the moment, but uh, through our automatic process, we hope to enlarge the corpus with uh, the other criminal judgments that are available at the High Court and possibly extend this to other um, types of cases. Um, okay. Some of the language analysis that we did was mainly for the purpose of classification. I know that I haven't spoken a lot in this presentation about the classification we had in mind. Um, but what we wanted to do is to classify the ju these judgments according to the International Classification for Crime Statistics, and that is the type of crime covered in the, in the case. So you can see here some of the collocates analysis can help us in understanding the type of crime, or at least the severity of the crime that might be useful in that classification. But as has been mentioned in other presentations, some of the key legal terms that we are interested in do not have high frequencies, so that is uh, indeed a challenge. And one way to overcome that is to use um, a collocation between key legal terms and the section of the laws that are ref referenced, or the law and case citations. Of course, that means that we will have to classify um, a priori this, um, these laws according to the classification, and that is not a, a trivial task. We have started to do that um, using the, the legal experts, uh, a, co a, colleague, a legal expert colleague, um, and we have made progress with that. So, um, 
The law and case annotation tasks was done uh, using a combined approach. Um, so we wanted to use full machine learning for that, but we needed to first create an annotated um, a data, an annotated data set. So what we did is we used uh, Spacey to start with, and then we incrementally improved that using um, uh, what Spacey offers in terms of um, a bit of pattern matching. Okay, so as you can see here, there's only three types of law citations that are mentioned. Okay, so some contain only the name of the act, uh, as you can see there, the penal code. Some um, contain labels and the name of the law, like you can, see, you can see in the second example, and some are using um, anaphor. So the anaphors can span more than one line. So um, these are trickier to deal with. Okay, in terms of case annotations, these come in a variety of forms because there are differences between neutral citations, uh, citations of unreported cases, um, and citations in official law reports. And there's three examples given on this slide. Um, this is a longer list of, of examples. You can, as you can see there, there's quite a bit of variety in terms of how the cases are mentioned. And um, you can see there are a lot of names that appear, names of people, names of organizations. So our annotation process uh, created files of this shape where you have uh, the paragraph where the annotation appears, the entity we recognized, and the start and the end of the citation. Okay. These were interesting. The experiments we did with spaces were quite interesting um, because we, they weren't quite as expected. Uh, one thing to uh, note there is Spacey already has an entity for law. Um, and the other thing we, we uh, noticed is uh, Spacey recognition depends a lot on the type of references that were present in the, in the models or in the training set used. And it, it really relies on a uniform use of punctuation. And if that is disturbed, some of the behavior is not so predictable. Um, so, for example, if there are extra spaces, your entity might not always be recognized. Entities of the same type might not always be recognized. Okay, if there are compounded entities, like you see there, section 339 and 340, that also is not always consistently recognized. We made uh, use of the entity ruler and the pattern matcher that exists in Spacey to improve on that. So, especially for recognizing uh, references that use more than uh, two levels of numbering or one level of numbering. Okay, and for the names of the law we use a pattern matcher. Uh, this table gives you uh, an idea of the uh, results we uh, obtained. So, um, the judgments, what you see here is that the text of our corpus is split in years. So, uh, 2010 judgments of 2010, 2011, and so on. On the second column, you can see the number of law entities that were retrieved using Spacey. This is, these are not necessarily uh, full entities, i.e. they could be par partially uh, matched. Okay? And then on the third column, you can see the entities, the number of entities we discovered using the enhanced method. Uh, which is the one using um, the entity ruler and the pattern matcher. <clears throat> we had to clean these entities because, um, you know, in, in many cases they were discovered in isolation. So, for example, the reference on its own and then the name of the law. So, we went through a process of uh, merging that, okay? <clears throat> There were several challenges to note here. Um, there were inconsistencies in how laws, regulations, statutes, and parties are referred to. There were frequent use of names and people uh, that appear in case names. And again, these are names 
particular to Malawi or Bantu names. And this uh, has led to mistakes in name entity recognition. And the other thing to note, there was a need to develop a case citator database, um, which we didn't have, and I don't think it exists. So we, this is our next, this is a work in progress at the moment. Um, because of the differences and inconsistencies in, in naming, uh, we would need to have uh, a case citator for accuracy, okay? Uh, in terms of machine learning, um, we have not managed to use our annotated set successfully. We've run a few experiments in which we um, use parts of our training set, but we found uh, found that to be unreliable. So we haven't published that in this paper, but we are still working on that. So really, there is still a great need for specially annotated data sets for machine learning. Okay, annotations that we are looking at uh, are n-grams, so contain more complex tokens, and that is challenging. And the other thing that we notice is chunking. Um, how to chunk the text and when to chunk the text for machine purposes, uh, machine learning purposes. And classification, uh, again, uh, is challenging. Um, we have started to use our corpus in developing a classification of the judgments, as I said to you, according to the International Classification for Crime Statistics um, purposes. And usually classification algorithms tend to work uh, using frequencies of, of, um, of terms, of legal terms. But in our case, some of these terms have low frequencies, hence they are challenging. Um, okay, and then we started to combine, use a combined approach by which we classify the laws themselves first, and we use uh, some of the contextual information that I showed you to finally classify our judgments. Okay, um, I think I should stop here. I probably spoke too much and to leave time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a great talk. Um, are there, uh, if there are any questions, can people unmute and ask? I had a general question. Um, where do you think this, uh, this uh, so this is clearly a great resource and a great data center and that there have been, has, like the issues with named entities, we, uh, people have seen those uh, as well. Uh, where do you think this data set would be most useful? What would be the most kind of impactful application that you envision for uh, how the data can be used? Okay, so, um... The main, as I said, uh, perhaps not very clearly, uh, apologies, um, the main purpose of this data set is to create uh, an internal library that uh, is capable of classifying the judgments according to the points of law that are discussed. So really, the main intention was to create uh, a summary of the judgment. However, we felt that we have to do that in stages. Well, first, we didn't have the text in a, in a format that could be processed. And then secondly, these are quite lengthy judgments and it will still require a human. So we wanted to have a semi-automatic tool that does that. So we, when we started to look at the text, we initially um, thought that we can uh, annotate all of the judgments by a legal expert um, but that's not really feasible. So um, we've started to create the corpus and annotate it first with the information that was missing, basically. And once we create a network of those uh, citations that we see in the text, including the legal terms, which I don't know if you've seen the International Classification for Crime Statistics. I know I haven't covered it in the presentation, but it basically classifies the crimes on certain levels. So you can have um, broad categories like uh, homicide, uh, which would be based on specific key terms that appear in the text. For example, malice afterthought, you know, uh, basically murder, there was 
done uh, intentionally, you know, with malice of the sort. And then you have other finer categories, for example, theft, but then you have theft by public officials and so on. So what we really wanted to capture is those specific keywords that we have in our text and classify the judgments. And while we do that, create that summary, the legal summary. So, um, but we discovered that we can't do that really because, um, yeah, because the text had to be prepared first in a way that can be processed by the machine. So hence the current approach. Okay, so it seems like uh, there's quite a lot of things that we can work on improving in order to enable more applications. It seems like that's the takeaway. Yes, well, well, the, the legal text is highly contextual and um, it's very difficult to chunk it. I mean, I, I struggle still to understand how you can chunk this text so you can really classify it using a pure machine uh, approach because a lot of the legal terms are so inter intertwined in the text. So um, this is where we were mainly focusing on, how to prepare this text so that it can be processed by a machine. Of course, the, the first step was to create that network of citations and to classify the laws themselves, um, that being a slightly easier task. Um, so that's basically where we are at the moment. The other, the other thing that we wanted to do is to make this text available in an online tool that can be used by legal practitioners in Malawi to improve access to um, the case law and the legal reasoning behind the judgments that were issued. Okay, thank you. Uh, is, are there, is there any other quick question? Otherwise, we can take a short uh, 